Givens Castle, Chicago's only castle, is located on the far southwest side of Chicago in the Beverly neighborhood at 10244 South Longwood Drive, about a half mile east of Western Avenue. It sits on a ridge, one of the highest points in Chicago. Many Chicagoans have neither seen it nor heard about it. The castle looks like a real medieval castle. It is three stories high, has towers with battlements, and is built of Joliet limestone. The castle was built in 1886 and 1887 under the direction of its first occupant, Robert C. Givens, wife Emma, son Robert Saltern, and he moved into the castle and lived there on and off until 1909. Givens was a prominent real estate developer who was a partner in the firm of E.A. Cummings & Company. Over the years, the castle has had four other keepers, including Julia Thayer and her Chicago Female College from 1895 to 1897, the Burdett family from 1909 to 1921, the Siemens family from 1921 to 1942, and Beverly Unitarian Church, also called BUC, from 1942 to the present. The castle itself has changed very little over its existence of over 130 years compared to the surrounding area. change was made in 1960, the port cocher, or carport, that was built around 1910 by then owners J.B. and Jesse Burdett, was torn down to build a children's addition. Over the years, maintaining a structure built of limestone has been difficult and expensive, and in April 2017, the church's property manager, Brian Otto, discovered some serious problems with the largest turret on the southeast side of the building while inspecting the roof. He noticed a large crack and missing mortar, and it appeared to be bulging a bit, which was impacting the roof. The Turret Task Force Committee was formed to discuss the problems with the turret and to recommend to the congregation what to do. In May 2017, MBB Enterprises of Chicago placed three custom steel bands and used flexible caulking on the southeast turret as a temporary fix. In June, Amy Lamb Woods, an architectural engineer with experience in historic preservation, did a two-hour walkthrough of the castle to determine the extent of the damage to the building. She made suggestions on what needed to be repaired and offered her not-for-profit company called Women in Restoration and Engineering, WIRE, to provide a free survey. The probable cost for the restoration would be over one million dollars. This is what the castle could look like if the turrets were not restored. The committee considered several options including selling the castle. Because the castle is part of the Longwood Drive Historic District, any decision to demolish the building or to change the facade would not be acceptable, so any prospective buyer would have to agree to complete the expensive renovation. The congregation voted in June 2018 to undertake the capital campaign to save the castle and pledged over $400,000. The committee renamed itself the Castle Restoration Task Force, with Carolyn Wilbon as chair. The restoration logo became Givens Beverly Castle, Chicago's only castle for the community-directed publications, and Givens Beverly Castle 
home of Beverly Unitarian Church when describing the church. Recommending a highly qualified architect, contractors, engineers, and other consultants was the work of AVA Consultants, LLC. Heather Amro, who had completed work at Lincoln Park Zoo, served as senior project manager. The company was hired by BUC in late August 2018. The proposal by Revive Architecture LLC of Evanston, Illinois, to give the pertinent design for temporarily stabilizing the turrets and repairing the main roof, chimney, and parapet walls was approved in late September 2018. Berglund Construction Company of Chicago did the actual stabilization using stainless steel straps and steel wire mesh. This temporary stabilization cost $12,500. The cost for scaffolding would have been even more expensive, but Berglund was able to use a much more cost-effective man lift instead. Berglund's work was more involved than just putting straps around the turrets. They had to remove loose material on and near the crenellations on the turrets and elsewhere, seal cracks, and seal the open joints on the north chimney. The task force used the large sign in front of the building that faces both 103rd Street and Longwood Drive to periodically include information about the restoration. Additional publicity for the restoration included articles appearing in various newspapers, such as the Chicago Tribune, the Southtown Star, the Beverly Review, and the Beverly Area Planning Association's The Villager. Moreover, the task force developed its own website and Facebook page, while Errol Magidson's website and Facebook page also discussed the restoration and need for donations. The first edition of Errol's book on the castle's history mentioned the structural problems. Errol's invited presentation on his book at the Newberry Library in April 2018 also helped. What dramatically increased publicity to have people all over Chicago know about this hidden treasure was the task forces being invited by the Chicago Architecture Center to have the castle as one of the buildings in its Open House Chicago tour of October 2018. This festival, which allows the public to explore revered buildings in Chicago neighborhoods without having to pay for admission, has been held annually since 2011. Eileen Cleese, BUC board chair, and Linda Lamberty, a member of the Restoration Task Force, created several large posters with images tracing the history of the castle. The posters were placed on display in the castle for the tour. About 3,000 people visited the castle on the tour's weekend. It was the second highest attendance for buildings outside the downtown area. In September 2019, Blair Kamen of the Chicago Tribune chose the castle as one of his top ten picks and it was identified in the title of his article along with a photograph. About 2,000 people walked through the castle in the 2019 Open House Chicago Tour. An added feature was the 2011 documentary about the castle being shown while people walked through the building. In May 2019, Task Force member Roberta Chalmers and Errol Magidson were on the Rick Cogan WGN radio show to talk about the campaign for saving the castle. Rick had written about the castle and had Errol on his evening show after the book on the castle was published. The proposal for the major design work to preserve the castle was approved in March 2019 and given to Revive Architecture LLC of Evanston, Illinois, because it was the most comprehensive and the lowest price of the three bids received. Mark I Restoration Company has done all the removal and rebuilding. Bill Maniatis of Mark I has served as the company's project manager. Galois and Van Etten cut stone contractors of Chicago in business since 1899 obtained and cut the stone. The project has been overseen by Project Management Advisors Incorporated, 
PMA, Real Estate Project and Development Consultants, that bought AVA but kept AVA's Castle Consulting Team. PMA has chaired construction meetings with BUC, the architect, and the contractor. Many of the limestone blocks have been from the original interior used in the towers. A membrane was applied to prevent water seepage from causing damage to the inside. In August 2020, Carolyn Wilbon, Restoration Task Force Chair, and Chris Enk, Architect with Revive, discuss the restoration project. Carolyn starts the conversation from the Southwest Tower. Okay, so now we are on the roof of the castle. And what we wanted to show you guys up here were a few of the different areas that we're doing some work on. And what we're standing in front of right now is the turret known affectionately as Mama Turret. This is the first turret that actually had the deconstruction and reconstruction. And as you can see right now, she is completely finished. Um, if you had a chance to take a look at some of the other pictures from the, before the construction started, um, she looks very different and we are very, very happy with the work that has happened here. So what happened that actually caused us to start this work is that in 2017, our property chair for the church was on the roof and noticed a big, huge crack in one of the other turrets, the one that we call Papa Turret, and he let the board know about that. And from there, we had a conditional assessment done for us by WIRE Women in Restoration and Engineering, and they told us that our project would be about a $1.2 million project. And from there, because we all love the castle so much, we knew that we had to restore her. And we put together a fabulous team. Here, Chris adds information. When we got on board, our first step was to evaluate the condition and identify some of the deficiencies that existed on the turrets as well as the parapet walls around the perimeter. And um, with the turrets themselves, with some uh, identification and investigation, we realized that um, there were multiple whites of stone, an inner layer of stone, inner white, and an outer white. And like many buildings from uh, this time period, there wasn't any reinforcement between the outer and inner white. So some of the deficiency, defic deficiencies we saw included cracking and then also some significant bowing of the outer white of masonry, uh, especially on the roof sides. So the recommendation uh, we continued was that the best long-term solution would be to dismantle the turrets down almost to the roof line and then rebuild them uh, back with the same appearance that they existed before. Um, so putting together the scope of work, we worked closely with uh, Chicago Landmarks um, staff on coming up with a scope of work which included their recommendation was to keep as much of the original material as possible and put it back in exactly the same locations that uh, the pieces were located before. So the first step to doing that was to create elevation drawings that had every single piece labeled with a separate label so that when the dismantling happened, they'd be able to be cataloged and identified. Um, so when the contractor came on board, the first step that they did was to start dismantling from the top down. They labeled each piece to correspond with those elevation drawings and then laid them all out in the parking lot in a fenced in area. That then we could come back and look at all those pieces as I know everyone from the church did as well to kind of see the, the turret when it was dismantled on the ground. Um, and so we went through at that point and identified which pieces could be salvaged and reused and which pieces were too deteriorated to be able to be reused. So um, with pieces that couldn't be salvaged, the recommendation from uh, the Chicago Landmark staff was to try and use salvaged pieces wherever possible. So some of the stones from the inside, the inner white, could be reused and then put back on the outside. And then there were a number of stones that were kind of part of the landscaping material on site in the middle of the parking area that some of those larger ones could be reused. And then we used two different kinds of stone for the replacement pieces. Since Joliet limestone isn't available anymore and hasn't really been used since the earlier part of the 20th century, uh, we couldn't get that material to replace pieces that were too far deteriorated. So instead we used um, Lannan stone to match the stones that were kind of a grayish color. And then we used Silverdale as you see here, to match pieces that were more the yellowish color. So if we were replacing a more yellow piece of stone, we tried to go back with a new sort of yellowish piece of stone so that the overall appearance was kind of the same in the end. And uh, that was the, the basic kind of start to the program there. In 
this segment, Carolyn talks about the parapets, a castle's uppermost walls, and the crenellations, which look like a series of teeth sticking up from the parapets with gaps between them. So all of these bags contain pieces of rocks or the stones that have come down from the parapet walls or the turrets that the pieces just kind of crumble, as Chris was saying, as they were taking them apart. So what the team does is that they keep their, all of the stones together in a bag just in case they can be used as they're putting things back together in any of the small places because of course we want to keep and use as much of the original stone as possible. In this segment, Chris discusses the stones that are used. So this is a good spot here to see some of the different stones that were used as part of the project. Um, as the main goal was to reuse as much of the original material as possible, when the turrets was, were rebuilt, the inner white was actually replaced with concrete masonry units, or concrete block on the inner white, and then the outer white of material, or the outer layer, was the original stone was largely used. So by doing that, a lot of extra pieces of stone were salvaged from the interior of the turret, um, and some of those could be reused for replacements for badly deteriorated ones on the front. And you can see here, um, the goal with uh, the rebuild was to try and use as many of the original pieces as possible. So here you can see some of these salvaged pieces waiting to be reused. And then for the lighter, grayer stones, um, we used lanin stone, uh, which matches the color of those for the most part. And then there are also a number of more yellowish stones that you can see throughout the turrets. And so the this is a new piece of Silverdale, which was specified for a placement uh, wherever the stones were more yellow in color, so that the overall appearance kind of has that varied look that it originally had um, if you look at the pre-construction process. Here, Carolyn describes the deterioration of some of the windows. So as you can see, we're now on part of the second floor looking at one of the smaller windows inside of Papa Turret. And you can see a lot of the, the deterioration that's also occurred um, on the outside of the building. These are also areas that are part of our overall restoration plan, but maybe not this restoration phase. In addition to the over $400,000 pledged by members of the church, the task force, led by members Jean Hardy Robinson and Stacy Recht, with construction information from members Carolyn Wilbon and Ken Small, were able to win several grants. One was for $240,000 from the City of Chicago Adopt a Landmark Commission. Landmarks Illinois gave $4,000. The Rebuild Illinois program pledged $300,000 if such funds are ever available, which is questionable considering the state's costs incurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. A Chicago businessman gave the castle $100,000, and a neighborhood couple has pledged up to $30,000 in matching funds contributed during the month of August 2020. The task force put a time capsule in the northeast turret, the smallest one, before its roof was completed. Included were the Chicago's Only Castle documentary video and the PDF version of the first edition of the book on DVD. Also included were Ridge Historical Society newsletter articles by Carol Flynn on Robert and Emma Givens. The documents on the restoration and recent BUC history, BUC contact, the monthly church newsletter, a grocery store receipt, and selected pages of the August 2nd Chicago Tribune and the August Villager were also added. Finally, souvenirs of the COVID-19 pandemic, such as a mask, were placed in the steel box. It is hoped most of the restoration will be completed by the end of this year. Givens Beverly Castle, Chicago's only castle, will now be preserved for future generations. Instead of darkness, there's now a rainbow of hope surrounding the castle.
In May 1960, when the children's addition to the castle was built, a non-sectarian preschool since 1962, church members sang a song in commemoration of that addition that many of us still celebrate about the castle and other historic and majestic buildings. This song used the words of John Ruskin, written in 1849, still so meaningful today. When we build, let us think we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be for such work as our descendants will thank us for, and let us think, as we lay stone on stone, that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them, and that people will say, as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, See, this our fathers did for us. And now we can say, See, this our fathers and mothers did for us.